very good evening to all of you. First, I must thank the National Library for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, and I gather there have been really prominent people before me. Uh, what I hope to share with you this evening is essentially our journey in science and technology from the point we started about 25 years ago, and then a look ahead for us into the future as we see what is in store for us for the next 25 or maybe 50 years. In essence, you know, 25 years is a very, very short time. So to look forward, we have to do a look back. We decided to invest seriously in science and technology only in 1991. In 1991, the government decided that, you know, for the future of Singapore, to ensure that we are able to create good jobs, to ride the technology wave, we should invest in science and technology. Prior to that, our two national universities were actually primarily teaching universities. We do some research, but in reality, we don't have the depth of research for us to be competitive globally. But in 1991, there was an intent to move forward, saying that we are going to be investing in science and technology, using that as one of the key trusts propelling our growth in the future. So if you look at 1991, what do we have then? We already have a thriving disk drive industry. Seagate was here, Maxter was here, Western Digital was here. But remember, during that time, your desktop computer was at the big size, the size of your briefcase. Inside there was a disk drive, and probably one out of two of those disk drives produced in Singapore. It was about 40 megabytes. Today, that same size of disk drive will give you in excess of 750 gigabytes. That is the technology transition we have seen since then. But have we ridden the wave with all these companies? We did. We not only rode the wave, we actually used that as one of the anchors for us to actually develop a slew of industries around the disk drive industry. At about the same time, in 1987, we decided to make a foray into developing for ourselves a semiconductor company called Chartered Semiconductor. Some of you may say that, well, you know, that has been sold. Is that a success for us? Well, as a company for Singapore, as part of Singapore Technologies, it has not been a success. But think of the technology then. At that time, the DRAM that you have was only about 64K, moving up to maybe, you know, uh, one to eight megabytes. Today, on your thumb drive, you get gigabytes. So that is a transition in that industry. What have we done for ourselves? Today, we have 14 independent fabs in Singapore. Correction, not independent fabs. Some of them actually belong to company ST Micro and Micron. But we have global foundries here that's very well established. We have UMC here. These two electronic companies have transitioned differently, but we have rode the wave. Along the way, we have built within our universities top-notch technology and scientists in semiconductors, in microelectronics, in material science, in magnetics that compare with the best in the world. I will share with you where that will take us going into the future. But that's where we started in 1991. Starting in 1991, we already had two institutes of research, one in manufacturing, but in reality, they were not the type of institutes which compares us with the top-notch universities and institutes in the United States, or UK, or Japan, or Europe. We had an Institute of Manufacturing Technology, but we also had a fledgling Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology. That was started because of the vision that Go King Sui had, attracting three Singaporean scientists from abroad to come back. You know, uh, Louis Lim, you know, Chris Tan, and Professor Chua Nam Hai. Today, we have a thriving biomedical science ecosystem, knowledge ecosystem. Have we been able to capitalize on it in building an industry for ourselves? We have to a degree. Can we do better? We can do very much better. So from 1991, when we decided to spend $2 billion for five years, that accounts for only about, that represented only about 0.3% of our GDP. Very, very small and modest. Even at that juncture in time, the ambition going to the future was to compare ourselves with leading edge nations in science and technology spending 1% of GDP, government spending, right? 
So today, in 2016, earlier this year, when Prime Minister announced our 2020 plan, we have set aside 19 billion, which equates to about 1% of our GDP. And with 1% of our GDP spent by the government, we hope to catalyze 2% being spent by industry. And we are working very hard to make sure that industry spends that, because if they do, it means we have a very, very vibrant ecosystem to translate technology out from the research performing agencies, institutes and universities to industry. That is a stretch target for us. We think we can reach it. We'll do our very best. And some of the schemes that we have put in place have seen some successes. Now, having said that, we are not enviable in an enviable situation like MIT or Stanford, where the companies are standing on the doorsteps seeing how they can take technologies out. So what the NRF does is try to catalyze the partnership between industries and the universities and institutes. And we have actually some very exciting outcomes. So today, we, spend, we expect to spend 19 billion for the next four, five years. We, but we started with $2 billion. Along the way, there were two inflection points. One inflection point was in the year 2000, 10 years after we started, where we decided that we need to build a biomedical science sector. Because when we first started in 1991, the focus was on the physical sciences, engineering, this drive, which is magnetics. And I started the Data Storage Institute in 1992. Microelectronics. We had a very thriving chemical sector, and we want to make sure that we move up the ladder in terms of the technology. So we started the Institute of Chemical and Engineering Sciences. We knew that high-performance computing was important, so we had the Institute of High-Performance Computing. So they were all in engineering. In addition, we had many institutes and centers, research centers in digital technology. We finally brought them all together and called them I2R, Institute for Infocom Research. So all the focus was on physical sciences and engineering. In reality, they were the real industries that powered Singapore's growth. But in the year 2000, we said that we need to grow another wing, and that is in biomedical sciences. So we brought in famous names from all over the world in a sense to jumpstart our ecosystem. So we had Sidney Brenner with us, and he was one of the people who agitated us to do more in the biomedical sciences. He introduced us to very well-known personalities from UK, right, which brought in people like David Lane, famous for the discovery of P53 gene. We brought in, you know, Philip Krulowski from the Pasteur Institute from France. And we have a slew of them to help us build our institutes. And along the way, as we expanded, we also built a thriving community in the university. So today, we have a biomedical science ecosystem that matches some of the best in the world in the areas that we choose to invest in. But the key is that, can we create value from what we have invested in? That is a big question that we have an answer for ourselves because you know, we have built this ecosystem for ourselves. The second inflection point was in the year 2006, when the National Research Foundation was formed with Dr. Tony Tan as the inaugural chairman. The intention then, if you see the ecosystem in Singapore, if Singapore wanted to be a R&D science and technology hub, having two top universities, the A-Star Institutes, does not provide for us the diversity and the number of institutes to allow us for the comp to provide a competition for the best ideas for us to be a true hub. So Dr. Tony Tan decided to form this with the support of the government with a very big jump in the amount of money we set aside for research from $6 billion to $13 billion. Right? That increase allowed us to really fund the university very, very effectively. And that actually propelled our two universities to what they are today globally competitive research universities. But it then begs the question, so what? Right? What it means today is that we are able to attract some of the best scientists in the world to work in our institutions, in the universities, provide the best facilities for our own young people to work on the best science. But for us, science is not only about excellent science. For Singapore, a small nation, unfortunately, or fortunately for us, it's science with relevance, excellence with relevance. 
And that is not sufficient. The key following the relevance is significance. Significance in terms of impact. The resources that we have is very limited. The per capita spend is very high. Percentage of GDP spend is very high. But in terms of absolute amount, it's small compared to what the UK spends, to, compared to what the UK spend, U, uh, Japan spends, compared to what the EU spends, compared to what the US spends. In the United States, the National Institute of Health spends 33 billion US dollars a year. My whole national budget is about 4 billion for everything. And they only spend that for health. Right? So we have to be very clever in choosing what to invest in. So what have we built for ourselves in this 25 years? Today in Singapore, we have a very, very effective, very reputable knowledge ecosystem. Our two universities are very well ranked. Our institutes are top rate. Why do I say our institutes are top rate? Because we partner the best companies in the world. Today, for example, you know, we have an aerospace consortium which counts Pratt & Whitney, Rolls-Royce, GE Aviation, Airbus, and Boeing as the key partners. They don't come together to work together, except in Singapore, to work on pre-competitive research. Right? With them there, we have a second tier of companies which forms part of the supply chain of our own local SMEs working with them. Today, some of the precision engineering work we do there some of the work we do in providing the facilities to support the engine makers is really world class. And that stems from the technologies we have in a slew of institutes under ASTAR as well as the universities. So we have a very, very effective, reputable, and leading edge knowledge ecosystem. Definitely in the physical sciences, in the areas that we choose to invest in. If you talk of graphene, for example, our graphene center in NUS matches the best in the world. Obviously, there's a huge graphene, graphene investment in graphene in Manchester, where two Nobel laureates reside. But one of them, Andrew Geim, actually comes to Singapore very often. In fact, he was on the verge of joining NUS when he won the Nobel Prize, and he decided to stay on in Manchester. And then the EC decided to give them a billion dollars. Right? But nevertheless, you know, in a focal, focus area that we choose to work on, we will be very good in, and we have to be very good in. In this world today, there's no room for the second-rate scientists. Companies work only with the best. But there's a small caveat to that. In the areas that are important for Singapore, even though we're not so good, we'll still invest. And then strive to build ourselves to be the very best. And a case in point is actually water technologies. So today, if you do an analysis of the scientists we have, we stand ranked number one, number two in the world. So what are some of the leading edge technologies in water filtration? Right? It is in hollow membranes, uh, hollow, hollow system membranes, you know, these uh, new technologies in nanotech and all this. NUS, the group in NUS, the group in NTU are very, very good at it. So we rank number two, number one, number two. Number three is possibly Delft, for example, who is also very good in this. And there is a slew of water companies, multinationals, and our own homegrown companies now coming up in Singapore. Right? What we have also in Singapore now are top-notch facilities. So as I said, in the areas that we choose to invest in, we have the best facilities. And we need to have the best facilities to do leading-edge science. And the key is how this leading-edge science then gets translated out for companies to work with us, top-notch multinationals, but that's not the end all for us. We want to work with our large local enterprises to provide them with the facilities to develop new products, new services. Uh, that has resulted, for example, in Capital Corporation, SEMCorp, SMRT, all these local companies working with our universities through corporate labs that they've invested into universities in partnership with NRF and the universities. We have actually developed for ourselves a very, very vibrant talent base. Our talent base is twofold in terms of our strategies for development. One, attracting the best to Singapore and providing the best opportunities for our own young people to go into science. Right? So today in Singapore, 
we pride ourselves in providing good opportunities for our own young people, at the same time, attracting the best people to come and develop a career in science in Singapore. Right? So, these are what we have built for ourselves. A good knowledge ecosystem comprising of institutions, facilities. We have attracted very good people to come here. We have good infrastructure. And finally, because of the commitment of the government, we have consistency in funding. That allows us to remain competitive even as the big nations around us develop and we find ourselves now hemmed in between India and China, for example. Yet, in those areas we choose to invest in, we think that we still have an edge. An example, when we built the Genomic Institute in the year 2000, when we attracted Professor Ed Liu from the NIH to come, we were ahead of everybody else, probably with the exception of Japan. In a flash, China decided to go into genomics with the resources they have, with the people they have, the Beijing you know, uh, Genomic Institute is now huge. They don't only have the resources to buy the best equipment, but they have the people, the talent, the people who are what we call the bioinformaticists to work in their systems. Right? So we have to be clever in then choosing what we're going to work on in genomics. So we shouldn't do run-of-the-mill genomics. If it's run-of-the-mill genomics, we should outsource to them, give them a contract to do it for us, to do the sequencing for us. So this is what we have built for ourselves. And along the way, we have actually saw, we have already seen you know, translation of technologies out working with companies in Singapore that have seen our GDP grow from $50 billion dollars, US dollars in 1992 to 300 billion US dollars today. Six-fold increase in our GDP growth. Of course, not entirely due to our investment in science, but if you look at the nature of the companies that we have in Singapore, the microelectronics industry, the chemical industries, the digital tech industries, the biomedical, uh, especially the medtech industries, science and technology had a very, very important role to play. Now, as we look forward, we ask ourselves, what is in store for us in the future? We tell ourselves there's lots of disruption. In particular, everybody talks about the digital disruption. But in reality, that is not the only disruption that we face. In reality, disruption is actually a continuum. That may be a bit of an oxymoron, but it's a reality. In my view, there are some bigger disruptions that seems to go under the radar screen. Climatic change, aging, the changes in our demographics, those are disruptions that we face in Singapore. Climatic change, if the sea level increase by a meter, just imagine what will happen to Singapore. We are a low-lying island state. If the salinity of the water changes, the environment around us change, our water resource will have to be put in question because we actually desalinate water for consumption. The percentage goes up and down depending on our other sources of water. Right? If the acidity of the sea changes, it will change the ecosystem around us and the environmental health of our water will change. So there are a lot of impact. There's a lot of things that will impact us. We don't face the storms as we see. I was told when I visited Scripps that because of climatic changes, the storm systems in the Java Sea will become bigger and bigger and bigger. We are fortunate, we are shielded, but we actually realize for ourselves there are climatic changes, you know, uh, even in Singapore. The microclimate in Singapore has actually changed over the years. How will that impact us? We do not know. But what is real is the haze. If all these things impact our neighbors, can we foresee a situation in the future that there's a perpetual haze over Singapore? If that situation occurs, what are we going to do? How are we going to manage our health? You know, how are we going to become a sustainable, vibrant city-state where we are no more attractive to companies to locate here, where even our own people here think that it's better to live somewhere else and to do business somewhere else? So those are the disruptions that will occur. But I thought today we'll address some of the, the current buzzwords of disruption, which is digital disruption. And we'll delve more in about, a, a little bit more into that. So 
as I said, disruption is a continuum and it's a persistent occurrence. If I, share, if I shared with you earlier the two benchmarks, the disk drive in terms of the, the capacity of the disk drive in 1992 and the capacity of disk drive today, the aerial density, the amount of data I can store on per square inch of a magnetic disk, then and now, big transformation. It has been, we have been discontinuously disrupted without us knowing. But today, there is a confluence of several disruptions in digital technology. One is compute power, right? The computer power that you have on a handphone far exceeds the desktop that you have 20 years ago. Pervasive connectivity. Today, you have 4G. 5G will be with us in late 2018 or 2019. When you have 5G, it, does, it means that, you know, if you have a family having a party in Los Angeles, they can stream it to you and it will be continuous without any disruption, right? Then it opens up the possibility of virtual and augmented reality. It says that, you know, your parents, the parents are in Singapore, the children are having a birthday party in LA, and you can really, seems to be there to be experiencing things with them. And they are able to see almost your physical presence there together with them, right? Will that happen? It is happening in the labs. It's not out there in industry yet, right? Uh, it is frightening, yet, you know, uh, it is very, very exciting. And then the availability of data. So because of, of the data I can store, and the data can be collected and stored, the key is that you can also now extract it out very, very fast, which means that if you put this all together, you can move into the new world of artificial intelligence. When I was a younger researcher in the 90s, right, we were working on neural networks and evolution computing. The same two key technologies that are used together for AI, except that the compute power then, you know, allows me to do very limited things, and it'll take a long, long time before it converges to a solution. If you ask this simple thing that I put together, a question, it takes them a long time to give me an answer. Today, it goes in a flash. But beyond this, it can do very much more. But that is just the start, you know. Uh, the AI that we see today is just the very, very tip of the iceberg of what it can do, right? So if you put this together, there are lots of things that we see as potential. At the same time, there are a lot of frightening things ahead of us, and we need to address them. Uh, for a start, you hear about cybersecurity, you know, uh, Comp people hacking into systems that belongs to credit card uh, companies, extracting your information, you know, uh, you're buying online, you know, your credit card is compromised and they get your information and they try to use your card data to go and do other naughty things. But there are something called social bots who can actually send out fake news, you know, fake information and actually confuses everything, right? So this is just the beginning. We hear over the BBC today, there's a small town in Macedonia that is a center for actually setting up fake information and fake news, right? So this is all very disturbing because they can actually you know, undermine democracy, they can under, undermine governance of city-states or, like or states or countries, right? So there are lots of confusing and worrying things. At the same time, if you look beyond this, there are opportunities. So if we prepare ourselves appropriately, there are opportunities that we can reap for ourselves, right? Even as cybersecurity poses a threat to all of us, there's a cybersecurity industry emerging to sell you products to protect you, right? So in Singapore, as, I, as the NRF invests in millions of dollars to do research to support, you know, uh, new, working on new ideas to protect ourselves from, you know, uh, uh, new malware and all kinds of uh, naughty things being developed. There are companies like Singtel, ST, that you know, has gone out into the world to buy new companies you know, and, and uh, now offering services and expanding their services. And you see startups coming out. Right? So it's exciting, but at the same time worrying. Another disruption because of this technology is this thing called the sharing economy. Right? You know, some of you may have come here using Grab Taxi or Uber. Right? You know, there's Airbnb. So these are companies that started without using or without having the, the, the necessity to have uh, expenditure on 
huge capital expenditure, buying property or you know, buying you know, uh, 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 equipment or facilities, right? You know, uh, we are able to use technology to support new business models. But more interestingly, I mean, th this sharing economy you've heard a lot. But there's another buzzword around and which is very, very critical. This is about blockchain. In simple terms, blockchain actually replaces the trust layer, right? The trust layer. Many of you here would have bought a property. When you buy a property, you actually use a lawyer. And the lawyer is actually the trust layer. Because you don't trust the buyer, the buyer don't trust, the, the, the seller and the buyer don't trust each other, so they use a lawyer. And uh, the lawyer then takes money, makes money from you. But in reality, the blockchain can replace that. Technology can replace that. So if you think about what blockchain can do for you, it replaces certain jobs or certain functions of lawyer. It can replace, for example, you know, uh, the, the brokers in the insurance industry, for example. You know. They will disrupt many things. But beyond that, it actually you know, can be a vehicle through which we actually you know, use for aspects of manufacturing, aspects of logistics, many, many different industries where the trust layer is required. Essentially, with this replacement of trust layer, it flattens a lot of things and becomes very, very flat. This is all with us. Recently, MES had a fintech festival, and you talk about these companies you know, uh, using blockchain technology, using AI, using data science to actually come up with new products and new services. Why can we go into this space now so readily? It's because of the investments in science that we have done earlier for the next 25 years. We do not only have people who are very good in this technology, in data science, in AI, in, in, uh, in all aspects of digital technology. Our universities have come out being able to attract some of the best faculty members to come to Singapore. Our two universities are very well placed. They are able to involve in the curriculum development with leading edge technologies and leading edge ideas. So our students, our young people that go to our universities come out competitive with the likes of those students that come from MIT, from Berkeley, from Stanford, everywhere. Right? So it's a whole ecosystem that we have built for ourselves with the investments we have made. So as we move into the next five years, we have decided to organize ourselves into four different domains. So this is how we are actually projecting ourselves to the industry and to the world. We say that for R&D in Singapore, for science and technology, we're going to all, all organize ourselves into four different domains. There are two key domains which never change. right? The health and biomedical sciences, which is actually biomedical sciences. The other one is actually in advanced manufacturing and engineering, which is the physical sciences. Right? For us, being practical Singaporeans, we put in the word advanced manufacturing there because that continues to be a very important segment of our economy. And in biomedical sciences, we don't only call it biomedical sciences or medical sciences. We have health because the work we do there must also impact the delivery of health care to our citizens. Right? So we call it health and biomedical sciences. But then why did we pick out two particular areas, the services and the digital economy and urban solutions and sustainability? Services and digital economy was picked out because we foresee tremendous disruption in those spaces. And we have already touched on that because of the disruption we see in terms of what is available to us now to support those disruptions, compute power, data availability, connectivity. So we have picked that out because it's going to describe many industries that have been a mainstay for us, for the financial industries, the logistics industry. All those that depend on digital tech will be impacted. Right? We also foresee impact onto our healthcare industry as well, because healthcare informatics will become very, very key. In urban solutions and sustainability, we think that we have a great opportunity right? We have made a success of water, but looking into the future, just look at the cities from Shanghai down to Jakarta. Every city will face problems and issues of resource management. All of them are stressed right to the point where they're about to have see catastrophic collapse in terms of their mobility, 
If you go to Shanghai, you can never guarantee your friend that you'll be able to be on time for a dinner appointment, right? That is the same if you're in Jakarta or Bangkok or even Kuala Lumpur, right? If you look at the power systems in Shanghai, there are big issues. As they continue to expand because of rural urban migration, it's, at, it's bursting at the seams. If you're going to refresh, how are you going to do it, right? The pollution, the environmental systems in Shanghai and all the big cities are also collapsing, right? We have a partnership with Shanghai Chautou University that looks basically at the environmental systems in Shanghai, basically looking at the water systems, right? We do not only look at you know, what is in the water in terms of pathogens, viruses, bacteria, but also antibiotics, right? By actually looking at the level of the antibiotics they have in the water system, the waste system, you actually know the health. That's a proxy measure of the health of the city, right? So there are many, many things that are happening that causes us, gives us concerns. Whilst we look at this, there is this thing which is related to climate change that sometimes we neglect. Because of climatic changes, it gives a higher probability of an emergence of a new infectious disease. New because we do not know whether what it is going to be like, whether it's going to be bacterial, it's going to be viral, you know, right? When SARS came to us in the early 2000s, there was great fear because we did not understand that coronavirus. Now we do. When MERS broke out in the Middle East, we knew, right? And that's because of our investments in, 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 the, in the science that we do in the universities, in the academic medical centers, and in hospitals. So when Zika came to us, we knew what it was, right? We quickly sequenced it. We understood that it's quite different from the virus in Brazil. We know how to manage it. And there was no issue. There's no fear, right? But there is great fear about new emerging infectious diseases because you don't know what it's going to be, right? But we have to be prepared for it, right? So urban solution and sustainability, we picked out as a great opportunity because we want to solve the issues for ourselves. We want Singapore to be sustainable even as we grow. We want it to continue to be vibrant. And as such, we need to address now not only the water issue, we need to address the nexus of water, energy, and waste. Right. Coupled on top of it, we must look at city systems of which mobility is a key issue. And a great opportunity. If we can solve our mobility problems, then you know, we can export that. But that is not an easy, easy issue, right? It's not only about autonomous vehicle or electromobility, you know. But we know there are some low-hanging fruits. You know, the overlap in demand and supply of taxis is actually very, very poor. There are lots of taxis floating around with no passengers and a lot of people waiting for taxis because the match is very poor because of lack of information. Now with data analytics, we can move towards providing a better and better match. If you have a better match, essentially, what it'll mean is that taxi driver need to drive less and earn more, and people waiting for taxis need to wait for a shorter period of time and get a ride, right? So Uber and Grab, of course, does a lot to you know, uh, uh, stir things up you know, and catalyze you know, the introduction of new technology in this space. So we have pulled this out, but the underlying science will still have to be funded, even as we look for opportunities to translate out to create new industries, to build new industries, right? So as you see the convergence, one of the things that is going to emerge is about artificial intelligence, you know. So today, we have a situation where, you know, uh, a lot of the lower level work, you know, is very mundane and can actually be replaced. For Singapore and countries like Japan, it's not a really big issue because with artificial intelligence, you know, we can actually replace a lot of systems in hospitals, in the HDB. For example, HDB has a system where now you call, you know, uh, the mundane questions, you know, that you ask the, H ADB, uh, the HDB, there will be a, actually a, a, a mechanical system, a machine actually replying you. If you call IRAS, there's also a machine there behind and they keep giving answers, right? And they're actually quite accurate. In fact, there was a study done in one American university, I think it was John Hopkins. They actually had a machine tutoring the students. And you tutor the students by remote, right? As students, you know, ask them questions, basically a machine reply. If they call up, there are some simple answers. So they have a lot of humans doing this tutoring, and then they have a machine. And when they did the feedback, guess who won? The machine won. The machine was rated the best, right? 
But this is only the beginning. It's not, you know, the most... It's still a machine after all, huh? right? It's still a machine after all. But, you know, uh, this is a, a slight glimpse into what the future holds, right? I don't think we should be afraid of it, but we should be circumspect about, you know, how and in what way this is going to impact us. There are legal issues, there are ethical issues to be addressed, you know, right? So, for example, you know, if they have an AI system, you know, uh, driving a, 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 a autonomous vehicle, for example, if that, you know, uh, knocks into somebody, who is liable, right? Is the machine liable, right? Is the designer of that machine liable? Or is it the owner of the vehicle liable? So there are lots of issues to be addressed going to the future, right? But it is with us. And uh, if you see what is in store in everything that we do, you know, uh, the intelligence bits, bit by bit, can be replaced, right? But, you know, uh, I'm very positive. I'm a techno-optimist. And I think that, you know, the opportunities for us abounds, you know, if we can handle this, because there are other interesting things for us to do, right? You know, so this is something that, you know, uh, 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 we have to be aware of. And what is interesting is that, you know, when you talk about AI, it's not about technology. We talk about languages, right? One of the things that we're very good in Singapore is actually handling natural language processing natural language processing. In I squared R, we have great expertise, in particular handling, you know, Southeast Asian languages, right? And it's going to be good business because, you know, people in Thailand, Laos, is not going to interface with a computer using English or Mandarin. They're going to interface it with the natural language. And a keyboard is a great impediment, right? So you want them to interact with the machines using the, the language, using what they're very most familiar with. It's about, you know, psychology. It's about neuroscience, you know? Right? So it's basically a combination of many, many different fields that will go into AI. Right? And it's still very nascent. There's a lot of hype about it. It will take a long time before you know, it's pervasively used in our homes, in our lives. But in small ways, they're getting into our lives without you actually knowing it. Right? If you have Apple phone, you have Siri, you know, uh, it learns your, 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 your speech, you know, and then it recognizes you. Then it's actually some level of intelligence, right? The basic intelligence is, you know, in a room, you know, it senses the presence of somebody and then the light switches on, right? And you think if you can agglomerate this intelligence, putting all the pieces together, then it moves. But can it learn like human? We are talking about natural learning, one-shot learning, you know, right? I look at him, I turn away, I can remember his face, right? I don't need to have lots of data being fed into me, right? A computer can't do that. It can't take a uh, look at him and go away and remember. It needs a lot of data to be fed into it, right? So this what they call one-shot learning, natural learning, and all this. So it's a lot of work to be done, very exciting, right? But you know, uh, again, we have to see how all this science, technology, and art now gets integrated to give us a bright future ahead for us if we can work it well. So there will be pervasive uh, application of artificial intelligence over time, you know. And I think, you know, uh, as I said, it will creep on us just like as you move from, you know, uh, S4 to S5 to S6 and to S7, hopefully not S7 <laughs> nodes, right, you know, which explodes in your, right? So, you know, uh, are we prepared for it? I think we should be prepared for it. If we are prepared for it, then we embrace it and we ride the tide, right? The key is that our institutions, our knowledge ecosystem, ready to capitalize on what the future holds for us and are we able to build our economy on the opportunities that presents itself, right? This leads me to something that we've been talking about in Singapore a lot, smart nation. To build for our smart, ourselves a smart nation, there are underlying, in my view, five, equal, five, five layers of infrastructure. Now, this is not the official government view. Eh? You ask you know, some of our ministers, they may all say different things. But as a technologist, I see five important underpinning infrastructure layers. First is connectivity. You cannot be a smart nation without connectivity, right? Two, 
we are actually building for ourselves a nationwide sensor network. A sensor network which comprises of our cameras. We have sensors actually for temperature, for pollutants, everything, to give us a sense of a city. Right? The sensor network. Three, when you have all this in place, you need to have a cybersecurity layer. Right? So, as an example, you know, you have all our traffic lights actually called all computer control. You cannot have that hacked into because it messes up with all your mobility. So you need to protect yourselves. The management of water system, your pumps and all this, managing our water systems, our grid. So there are lots of infrastructure systems that are managed by computers. We ensure that all these systems are, you know, have taken into consideration the cybersecurity. The cybersecurity layer is, is very, very, very critical. Right? And then there's another layer, which we call the virtualization of Singapore. If I can virtualize the whole of Singapore, basically then I can overlay on this virtualization of Singapore, the sensor networks, the sensor data, the live data. You, when you virtualize the whole of Singapore, it's basically using legacy data. You know, legacy, basically your topographical data, your geological data, geographical data, your building data, and all this, right? Once you virtualize this, I can overlay on this live data, the camera data, or even you click a bus stop, it tells you when the next bus is coming. Right? What use is it? If I can virtualize it, you know, uh, do you know how hard is it for a handicapped person to navigate on a wheelchair from one point to the other point in an HDB estate? With this, you know, it gives you the shortest path where you have all the ramps and all this to move through. Right. It can be used as a planning tool. It can be used for many different purposes. But this is only the first step. It's not an easy task. So what I want to show you is basically a short video clip about uh, the, progr the, the, the program that we have started to virtualize the whole of Singapore together with Dassault System. Dassault System has got some of the best visualization software in the world, and this is what we are doing with them. So uh, Charlotte, can you just show this short clip called Virtual Singapore? So you see what it can tell me. It can tell me, it can give me the shading profile when the sun is at different time of the day. So I can actually calculate basically how much energy I can get from uh, solar cells if I put solar cells on top of all the HDB blocks, for example. Right? You know, it can tell me a lot of things. So it can be used by planners, it can be used by citizens, it can be used by industry, and for many, many different different forms. In fact. When this has been available to the public, it's up to the management of, the management of each individual to see what apps they can build using what they have here. Of course, there are concerns about security, but that is going to be with us. We need to have, we need to have that always in our mind, right? But even if we don't do this, there are some basic forms given to you by Google Maps and you know, uh, 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 all the things that Google supplies now, right? Except that this is very much more sophisticated and you know, uh, in terms of planning, for example, if I lay overlay on, onto this, basically the live mobility data, for example, all the traffic on the roads. And if there is a big event, for example, the F1, when that stops, how do people disperse? I can actually do real-time readjustment to exits and uh, uh, opening up of exits here and there to facilitate you know, a dispersion, for example. Or if there is an accident in Jurong East, you know, how do I actually, you know, change the traffic pattern to make sure that it's convenient for everybody else. 
And of course, you know, in a very, very, very bad scenario, if you have a dirty bomb, how do I make sure that, you know, my citizens are safe and areas are sequestered, for example? Those are planning purposes. We know, for example, even as of now with this, we are actually doing an experiment to see how we can actually design blocks of uh, living spaces in Jurong West, noting that, you know, we have a live firing range, so that, you know, what should we do in between to make sure that the noise doesn't reach the living uh, spaces that we're going to build in the future. Right? So the virtualization of Singapore is one of the infrastructure layer we want to put in place to support you know, the development of smart Singapore. Right? So you think about it, connectivity, sensors, cybersecurity, virtual Singapore, uh, all this will support the vertical smart mobility. Smart mobility uh, requires us to have all these layers in place. Right. Smart mobility in the future means that mobility on demand. If I don't have a car, if I don't have my own private transportation, but if I want to go from point A to point B using digital technology, it will let me know that you know, I can have something coming to my, my home or the point where I am to pick me up in two minutes or one minute and to be able to bring me to a certain destination without inconveniencing me. Right. So you need to optimize that. If that is so, then we would have achieved you know, a tremendous big leap in obviating the need for public transport whilst providing everybody with the most convenience, uh, with convenience in mobility. Right. So we are very excited about this virtual Singapore. And uh, this is uh, in a, we have started this about a year and a half ago. You know, uh, we have advanced somewhat. We have actually two models of Bishan. We have done one for Ang Mo Kio, right? And uh, those are exemplars of how we're going to move forward. Whilst we actually look above ground, we are also now looking underground. What we want to do is actually to virtualize three-dimensional Singapore, right? Not only the surface, but above and below, because we really need to work, make use of both above ground, underground, and on the surface for us in Singapore. Now, as we move towards smart Singapore, you have heard about this Internet of Things, right? Internet of Things. We, we go to the internet, we are linked between computers, websites, and all this. But essentially, all our cars can be linked to one another. And in some sense, there are. You, know, you buy a BMW, BMW, you subscribe to their services, they actually know where your car is, they know what's wrong with your car because they're polling your car's information. Today, every Rolls Royce engine, Rolls -Royce engine in the air is tracked, right? You know? So they actually know the state of the engines because Rolls-Royce sell flying time. So now you basically have an internet of all these machines up there. There's nothing to prevent the next move of basically having all the appliances in your home, you know, being networked together, right? So your fridge is talking to your, to, to, uh, to your grocery supply. It says, oh, you're down on eggs, you know, you need to have a new supply, right? You know? So all this will happen is a question of when, how, right? It happens, right? But even as you have people-to-people -people connected, as we are now in the internet, you have actually machines-to-machines, people-to-machines. Just give a thought. Today, you know, uh, we have basically a road tax tag. And then we have a card where we use to pay all the ERPs, right? In reality, you can actually have one device, right? And that, if there's an active device, which may come with ERP tool, huh? right? And that actually talks to a, the government's machine to track where you are and where you have been, you know, so they can tax you. But they can also talk to one another, right? So in reality, this can be very good. In fact, there was a situation where a car, a Mercedes-Benz with an active collision control actually stop in time because the driver goes off, right? You know, so this car is going to have a lot of intelligence looking at the surrounding. But imagine in a future where our infrastructure is also sensorized and cars are talking to one another and cars are talking to the infrastructure. But of course, our intention is not to load our roads with cars. We want to take cars off the roads, but to actually provide mobility without, you know, private transport. But all this is going to happen. But even as all this happens, you see, I got this hideous figure below, you know, cybersecurity, right? It's, it's going to, we have to worry about national security, 
We have to worry about privacy. We have to worry about our own personal security, right? Because it will impact your personal security, right? So it's not all a bed of roses, but you know, this. But this is the world before us. But you know, we have always faced up to this, right? At every turn, every disruption, there are opportunities and there are issues and there are concerns. But we have always, you know, managed it, right? So, what can we look forward to? Smart homes, smart logistics, drones, and all this. You know, in in Japan, Chiba is going to be a drone city, right? When the Olympics go to Japan, they believe that you know Chiba will be the first drone city where the you know flight paths will be reserved for drones, and you live in a apartment. Basically, you know you have a landing pad, and you know drone come and deliver your groceries, whatever you ordered from online, you know be delivered that way, right? Uh, manufacturing will change tremendously. The way we consume will change. Our young kids are actually you know uh, uh, consuming very differently. They buy online, you know, uh, uh, they don't go to the shops anymore. So as consumption change, the whole world of manufacturing will change, right? Will manufacturing be, as we see now, in a big factory? Or will it, you know, be smaller factories all, all over the world and they come together, get integrated and finish? Not necessarily by the manufacturer, maybe by the logistics a company who has got to deliver it, right? Who knows? We do not know. But these are the things that we have to, we have to be aware of going to the future. That's why we're experimenting with different paradigms, looking at industry 4.0, digital manufacturing, smart health. The key is that we have to move beyond what we are today, managing diseases. You know, there is a view that, you know, our Ministry of Health is, or oh, actually not ours, every nation's Ministry of Health is a Ministry of Disease. They don't manufacture, I mean, they are, they are looking after you because you're sick. But the key is that we have to move towards managing health, right? The key is how to ensure that we are healthy and don't fall sick, right? You know, so smart health, you know, technology to s support us in our drive to be healthier, telling you what you should do, what you should not do, but in a manner that is not obtrusive, intrusive, right? You don't want this, be this one to tell you, don't drink, don't drink, don't drink, you know? Because once in a while you want to have a drink, right? You know, so, but if you look at what this does, technology does, it has got many different things, right? I've seen, you know, uh, uh, technologies using AI. You know, one of the bigger, the most difficult thing about, you know, AI in health, you know, oh, it says you collect data, I can tell you different things. The key is, can this machine predict for somebody who has got epilepsy that he is going to have an attack? Because the, 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 the window for detection is so narrow, right? So because if you can predict that, then you can put in mitigating measures for the person who's going to get that. So from that to actually managing, using your Fitbit, everything, to, you know, to induce you to be healthier, there's going to be a world of change that is going to be upon us, right? Supporting the young, supporting the aged in different forms. And smart homes, right? There's a big program we are discussing with EDB, working with you know, partners in, in France and Singapore and the universities to how to be the real test bed for a real smart home for future for the aged so that you know, we all can age in place, right? uh, still feel comfortable, but knowing that we are being cared for. Right? We talk about humanoids, robotics. I think this is something which is very exciting, very trendy, but it is real, right? It is real. There's a, there's a hotel chain in Japan that actually uses robots. The only thing that this robot can't do, as they tell us, is that they can't do work which requires using water, like mopping the floor and cleaning. They can't do that. That one, they use humans. Everything else, they use robots, right? And in an environment like Japan, where they have a fast aging population, you know, this is a necessity. And it seems the feedback from their clients is that, you know, they have no drop in actually satisfaction levels, right? So, what is going to change for us in Singapore? There is the healthcare industry that requires us to look into the use of robotics to support our nursing community. We need to look to see how actually robots can be used to do mundane things for us, like you know, cleaning you know, uh, hawker centers and things like that. But something that we have done recently is to help you know, uh, the universities pair up with a company to support what NEA requires. 
basically a chlorine robot to go into all the sewerage systems to look for basically stagnant water with lava. Why? Because mosquitoes, right? So you, if you have that, you, can, you know, it crawls in and, and so it's an application of robotics. It comes in so many different forms, not only social robots, not only robots for, you know, manufacturing, but also robots for these kind of applications. We actually announced the PigBot, which is actually one for detection of, you know, uh, 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 the quality of paints and, and, uh, and surfaces with uh, JTC. So there are lots of applications where actually robots can, can replace humans, but for good reasons, for, for good reasons, right? Medical robots, some of the achievements from our previous funding, we actually funded a big program in gastric and colon cancer because that is one of the most pervasive cancer for Singaporeans. Uh, the lead PI was Professor Yoke Guan, who is a dean of medicine. But one of the site program was actually to look to see how they can use the endoscope to be a surgical tool. And Professor Lawrence Ho, partnering you know, uh, uh, Louis Fee from NTU, came up with this medical robotic system, which is the endoscope, which actually has got like a claw system, like a crab, you know, to be able to cut out a tumor, which means that they can actually cut out a tumor in the colon without actually opening up your stomach, which means that the recovery is very, very, very fast. So this has been commercialized, right? Uh, even as they commercialize it, they're actually coming up with another new invention, which is using Roman spectroscopy to do early detection of, of cancer. Because, you know, stomach and colon cancer, as I was told, and I'm not a doctor, that it's always subcutaneous until it is stage four, right? So with Raman spectroscopy, they can pick it up in a very early stage, right? So these are some of the outcomes that we like to see from the investments we do in research. And even as we see the outcomes, we are actually very positive and excited about what is in store for us going into the future. So we've talked about the world of mobility. I'll skip through this because, you know, time is, is, is running up. But, you know, uh, we think that for Singapore, this can be like a water story for us. So this is one of the big programs that we are doing as a whole of government, LTA, working with the universities, working with the institutes, you know, working with all parts, of, working with uh, SLA, working with, you know, uh, HDB, all this, to basically drive uh, the mobility solution for Singapore going to the future. I thought I should flesh it up because, you know, there, is man, there are many, many criticisms or many uh, 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 commentary about us spending so much money on health and biomedical sciences. Sure, you know, uh, we're working on genomics, we're working on molecular and cell biology, we're working on immunology. You know, what has that result for us? We now have a cadre of scientists that addresses a lot of very interesting issues relevant to us. In Singapore, you talk about diseases, there are two viruses that are very critical. The HN virus, which is flu, the coronavirus, which is which brought SARS to us and MERS. But we are also very concerned about mosquito-borne diseases, which is malaria, dengue, Zika, and chikukunia, right? You know, some are not fatal, right? But, you know, uh, people get sick, not well. We lose mandates in terms of, you know, productivity. And not only that, they impact families, you know, right? So we have... Top-notch scientist. Shimei is one of our scholars, which was funded by, you know, a, a, a A-star. She came back. She's now on investigation. She's our top scientist that addresses the Zika virus, right? You know, for example, when that broke up, she is able to uh, tell and share with everybody what this virus is about, how it manifests itself, you know, how, how it impacts humans, etc. And, you know, uh, Lin Fa is another great scientist in Duke, and he works on actually how bats transmit diseases, right? So we have a very, very vibrant ecosystem that addresses not only opportunities for us in terms of therapeutics that could emerge, right? But also in terms of the diseases that are important for us, like this infectious diseases. We have, for example, through investments in research, top-notch scientists in ophthalmology. Our ophthalmologists are some of the best in the world, right? And they have come up with therapeutics. They have come up with systems for early screening of glaucoma, right? So we have come up with actually processes, procedures that impacts the health of our citizens, right? But 
finally, going to the future is about us being sustainable. I've talked about this. The nexus of water, energy, land, which is waste, is very, very critical for us. We pick up land because, for us, we are land constrained. We cannot do anything about it. We have 700 square kilometers of land, 700 square kilometers of sea, and I cannot reclaim most from the sea because if we claim for more from the sea, we have no place to put our ships because ships bring us income, right? So we are really caught in a bind. So we have to make use, uh, we, make, we have to make good use of whatever we have, right? How do we make use, good use of, use of uh, the land we have? Well, can we make use of underground spaces, right? For example, uh, don't quote me, but we are trying to push in the future, near future, to move all our substations underground. But we're not going to move these big structures underground. If I move away from using the transformers today towards the new technology of power semiconductors, basically one big substation can be represented by one cubic meter of electronics. And you put them underground, basically you free up space for ourselves. It can be for living spaces, it can be for recreation, but essentially it gives us more space. Right? So if you move a lot of our amenities underground, or the facilities to give us the, the you know, air conditioning, everything underground, it actually creates more space for us. So this nexus is very, very critical for us. Water is, continues to be an issue that we need to be aware of, but water issue is an energy issue. For us currently to desalinate one cubic meter water requires 1.5 kilowatt hour, and we are the best together with the Israelis, right? We're trying to push to one kilowatt hour. One kilowatt hour is actually at the boundaries of physics, right? But we are energy constrained. So if you want to desalinate water, you want to get water by reverse osmosis, you need to create a pressure, you need energy, right? So we need to solve that together. We cannot solve one and then forget the other. Then you have problems the other side, right? So are we ready for disruption? I think we are because of the investment we made. The key is for us to bring science closer to all our citizens, for them, for our whole as the nation as a whole, to appreciate the power of science and to be able to capitalize on science for ourselves going forward, building our economy as well as building solutions for ourselves. The key in science is not only now about building the economy, attracting investments to Singapore, building new companies. It's about also coming up with solutions for some of the issues Singapore faces. Right? Issues related to land, water, sea, waste, you know, uh, health. Right? So we ask ourselves, you know, uh, where is the big, big corporation going to come out in Singapore? You know, Capel, Samcorp, Singapore Airlines, Singtel, they're actually from the previous generation. So we hope our indigenous technology will provide, you know, uh, opportunities for new companies to be built by our own SMEs, by our own LAs, or also from our own startups. So today, when we talk about economic transformation, it's not only about multinationals. We have to see how technology can be translated out to our own large local enterprises, how our own SMEs can actually use technology to become globally competitive, and opportunities for people to use technologies to start up with new ideas, right? Oh, you see Capital Land there. You know, Capital Land is very worried they came to see us. Right? When people buy online, that means all their malls, you know, have a lot of people going there, you know, to enjoy the aircon but not buying anything. Right? So they have to change. A lot of them now have got a lot of restaurants. Uh, restaurants, you know, you want to eat, you know, food straight from the kitchen, you have to be there at a restaurant, right? You cannot be sending to your home by delivery, you know. It's not so nice, right? <laughs> so people have to transform themselves to be destinations. So they must be experiential destinations, right? People go there for an experience, right? So they must transform themselves with new ideas, right? Okay? So today they're talking about malls which you go there to view things, but you buy online at the location, right? So, you know, they have to transform themselves with new business paradigms, right? So for us as the National Research Foundation, I've got three fears. One, I fear the fact that I'm funding mediocre science, so I want to fund the best science. Otherwise, public money is wasted. Two, I fear that there is not effective translation out. Right? So, you know, a lot of our companies are very used to taking technologies from abroad. Right? 
But we now have indigenous technologies. How do we catalyze taking technologies out so that they are utilized by our companies to generate new processes, to build new products, right? Third, you know, are the services and the products we develop competitive and has access to the markets, right? Okay? In the first two, the NRF probably has got more levers to try to catalyze. So we see our role as, you know, facilitating, catalyzing the partnership between companies, industry with our university. We actually see ourselves trying to catalyze, you know, the partnership between universities so that they actually do the best science, they are able to address big issues and to see how they are best translated out for impact for Singapore. So, excellent science with relevance for us. It must be relevant. I, I can't fund, you know, if a young man says, you know, I'm interested in doing research in CERN, you know, on particle physics, I ask, you know, when you've graduated and come back, what do you do, you know, in Singapore, right? You know, somebody says, and we have a, got a young person approaching, I want to do upper atmosphere research. So where can he do this? He can go in the U.S. and then do research work in, you know, in Colorado, Colorado, looking at, you know, a, uh, in the observatory, you know. I say if you come down a bit lower, looking at, you know, uh, 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 the, the atmosphere, uh, 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 in things out there that impacts microclimate, you know, I would be more interested because it impacts Singapore, right? Then we can utilize it and you can do work in Singapore. So we can't fund everything will fund the best science that is relevant to us in Singapore. And having done so, we want to now push to make sure that there is impact, but significant impact from the funding we have. So when my two universities, and I'm from both of them, they say, oh, we are ranked this and ranked that, I asked Professor Tan Cho Chan and Professor Bertie Anderson, so what? What does this mean for Singapore? Right? So that is a question we have to answer for ourselves and push them to answer. For me, the so what means that it's going to impact our industries because technology can be translated out, can be pushed out. It impacts, for example, you know, a better delivery of health to our citizens because of what has come out from our labs in our academic medical centers, right? So we are heartened, for example, when you know, Zika broke out. We knew exactly from our science how this disease manifests itself, how this virus behaves. So we are comfortable. We know how to manage it. There was no fear. I was the principal of Republic Poly when SARS broke out. I can tell you there was fear. Right? Waisin was in a, was in a Ministry of Education, was the principal of uh, St. Andrews. When he ran this institution, at that time, we did not know how this disease you know, spreads and all this. There was fear because our healthcare workers were dying, you know, and we could not understand it. There was fear. When MERS broke out, we knew how that disease is because we understand the virus now, right? So that stems from the fact that we have the capability to do this for ourselves, right? And we have built capabilities in vaccine development and all this, right? So with this, as we now it's something, I'll, I'll stop and you know, if you have any questions, I'm most happy to, to answer you. Uh, Professor, just uh, on the point of disruption, uh, in any system, there's always a human link. So my question to you is, uh, how do we prepare the masses to adopt the, the, the new technology so that uh, at least to prevent or minimize uh, disruption? Because uh, the reason why I say that is I think we have been complaining that there's a, a lot of people going to the banking line because of uh, maybe the bonus are better and the power line, nobody wants to join the, the, the power utilities. And uh, now we are talking about blockchain and blockchain is trying to remove the middleman. So that means the banking system have to modify their services to suit this new system. Yeah, that's it. I think you are absolutely correct. I think the, one of the biggest concerns we have is whether our citizens are prepared for the disruptions going ahead. We know that the banking industry will be disrupted. The financial industry, rather than just banking, will be disrupted, right? So that's why, you know, uh, People like Piyush and all this are trying to prepare their companies for the new era where you know they have to run traditional banking services alongside you know new financial services, you know uh, microfinancing and all this where you know uh, 
the new technologies will be able to to uh, to support, right? But actually, beyond that, you know, uh, beyond all this that disrupts basically the, the the job types that we see and the industry uh, texture that we have, is about our citizens whether they can live in an era where you know digital technology is pervasive, where you know our lifestyles are disrupted because we need to. Uh, work alongside, you know, uh, uh, there's a constant discussion going on. So, you know, um, the key thing about, you know, education is uh, clearly for us, we must move beyond the linear learning that we have to experiential learning, to contextual learning, you know, uh, so that's why you know uh, a lot of universities and our polytechnics are already changing the modality of their pedagogical approaches, right? Uh, rather than you know, during, are you an engineer? Maybe, yeah. During our time, right? We do physics, we do chemistry, we do biology. Then we go to university, we do maths, we do circuit theory, we do control. But in reality, they're related. So the pro approach going forward is to see how we actually come up approach which actually integrates and contextualizes so that when you learn it's not in silos but in an integrated fashion and it is contextualized into so you know uh, I, I'm sorry I'm going to use a you know singularity point a singular point right it's impossible to describe right as, as, as only in a, in a mathematical form but in reality you know you need to contextualize it so that you know we can understand right if you're an electrical engineer how to explain reactive power Right? So people say, oh, it's the frost on top of the beer, you know, that's reactive power. It's power there, but it's useless, right? But, you know, it's got no, no, not much meaning, right? So the key is to how to teach in a manner that is contextualized. So the, the educational system will have to change. In fact, we think a lot of things in Singapore have to change for the future, right? A lot of things will have to change. Some of the things that will change, I cannot discuss with you yet because, you know. <laughs> Afterwards, we can, we can talk about it. Because the, the world is changing, right? The world is changing, right? It has always been changing, except that the changes are now happening faster and faster. I call it the clock speed. The clock speed is now faster and faster and faster, right? But, you know, uh, I don't know. I believe that there is an asymptote. At some point, you, you, you can't move faster. You will, you will break down, you know, right? Good evening, Professor Lau. Um... Uh, my name is Tokman. I stand as a young adult before you and I understand that you are the CEO of the NRF. Um, I have two issues I'd like to bring up, basically. That is, um, I understand that your talk is mostly about how science and technology is relevant and necessary to uh, improve the economic uh, growth of our country in view of the long run. Um, my first issue I'd like to bring up is uh, perhaps on our view of the research and development in our country. As we have noted with the Ministry of Education, how the view of students and, and uh, parents as like, quote-unquote uh, customers of the MOE, I wonder is it um, relevant? I wonder, is it this, uh, likewise in parallel that the profit-drivenness of our R&D sector uh, affects our output in research, basically? Because as you have said, that research is not exactly about the expenditure, but also the quality of our people. So if it's very economic-driven, I wonder about the effectiveness of our research in general. Um, our second, my second issue I'd like to point out is about... Um, what you, what you consider disruption, basically, which is uh, our outsourcing of uh, scientists and our ability to attract new people from our young, our young scientists, uh, basically, to work with us. Um, I, come from a, I come from a JC, and I like to reflect on like, what I've seen among the people, among our students, uh, as a, their view of uh, research in general. So. Basically, the view of our research is very negative. That's how I would summarize it. Because, for example, is that research is often regarded as a very alienated, is regarded as a very elitist, alienated uh, field that is not to be touched by the common man. 
as, as they would describe it. And the thing with that is that it becomes very hard to attract the necessary people with maybe potential talent that is necessary for our economy to grow. And I find it very disturbing. And on top of that, like, when we have uh, corporations like ASTAR, which are very economically driven, the problem is that when they get, when many of my friends who have gotten their internships with ASTAR, honestly, the things that they have done there are pathetic. Like, all they have done is wash test tubes. I, I kid you not. They wash test tubes after internship for getting very good grades, just for a piece of paper show, I have interned at ASTAR. And then because of that, they have a very poor understanding as to what really research constitutes. And I find it a, a possibility that drives them away from research. And then they end up going to work at, like, I mean, they maybe prefer to go overseas universities. And I also find that our perception of our local universities is like the best in the world, maybe perhaps a bit too highly praising of ourselves, which is might be for the bad or for the good, I'm not sure. So basically, I find the view might, necess might need to be changed. I don't know. Like, what's your opinion? Thank well, you. we spent 1% of our GDP on research. 1% of the GDP is a lot of money. We have to make sure that you know, it translates to something that's effective for Singapore and Singaporeans. And there are basically two important things for us. How it contributes to the growth of our economy, because if there's no economic intent from the research, what we do, then what is going to feed back into the research and education? One, every scientist, even the Nobel laureates, want to see his work applied. It's no, nothing called basic science or applied science. It's actually science that has yet to be applied or science that's being applied. One, two, Science has got to, science and technology has got to be utilized to solve our national issues. And we have put that to use to solve our national issues. What national issues? Water is one of them. Two, I just described the nexus of energy and waste, right? So we have to use that. If we invest in biomedical science, we have to ask the question, is it to find a new drug? Or some of the work we do will translate into processes, procedures that can be used to impact the delivery of health to our citizens. So today, you go to SNEC, you get the best eye care. Why? You're actually getting basically the outcomes from the work we do in the SERI, the Singapore Eye Research Institute, which we put a lot of money in, which comes up with new therapeutics for glaucoma, new uh, uh, screening processes for early detection of you know, eye diseases and actually using the eye as an early detection for, for cardiovascular, for example. So there must be outcomes. Otherwise, it begs the question, why do we spend so much on research? Right? So, you know, even the people, I mean, you know, I've got many people I come in contact with that are Nobel laureates, you know, uh, people who are Millennium Award winners, they all want to see their work, you know, uh, some are very altruistic, you know, improving mankind, improving our lives. But in, and invariably, you know, it has got to be translated by industry so that the impact can be experienced at scale for people, right? So that's one. So ASTAR was set up particularly to support industry. But ASTAR is only one component of the total ecosystem. In Singapore, the two universities form the other component. The create partnerships that we have is a third and the academic medical centers that does medical research is a fourth. So it's a, we have a fairly wide ecosystem. But we need an agency like CREATE, uh, like, like uh, ASTAR, to drive the work we do with industries. So we anchor in, in, a, in the early years the foreign direct investments. Bring in Pratt and Winnie, Rolls Royce, Procter and Gamble, Nestle, and all this to do high value work. But now we are looking beyond that to see how we can actually use technology to support our large local enterprises. You know, we promote startups, you know, and all this. So that's the first question. The second one, you know, uh, about, you know, people seeing research as elitist, you know, uh, it's, it, really, it really depends on the passion of, of research. Like, you know, I come from a small town in Malaysia, right? That's how I started. I came here to do my A-levels in Singapore, not in a JC, right? in what would some of you now call a secondary Singapore school. But I've got a passion for what I want to do, right? You know, uh, it's exciting. And uh, as I do what I do, I get offers actually for jobs in industry, in Warren, Michigan, in uh, 
uh, jet propulsion labs in, uh, in LA. But I chose to come back to Singapore, right? You know, uh, and I've been doing very interesting work here. But, you know, uh, the fact that some of your friends may have bad experience with A-Star, uh, I, I, I will take your feedback back, you know, right? You know, uh, <laughs> by the same token, by the same token, you know, I have very positive feedback from those students that actually f do projects and do internship in IBM. You know, I got students from Victoria JC and other JCs that go do internship at IMRI. They all have very good experiences, you know. Uh, so it's very, I believe it's mixed, uh, but I will take your feedback back to ASTA. Can you tell me which institute? I'll, I'll bring it back, uh, you know. That would be even better. Which JC are you from and where, you know. That it gives, feedback is important because we actually want to give our young people good experiences. But I must tell you that we are not, not short of young Singaporeans who want to take up scholarships, A-star, national science scholarships, and other scholarships to go and do research. We don't have enough. We'd like to have more young people excited about science rather than excited about banking and business administration, right? Because I feel that, you know, after doing engineering and science, you can become a lawyer, you can become a, a banker. But if you go in that direction, you can't go back and become a scientist. <laughs> But I'm biased because I'm a person in science, right? I find it very exciting to do science, right? You know, uh, so, so young man, you know, uh, don't be so disillusioned. I give us a fact, feedback. I mean, there are colleagues of mine from A Star here, and I've got a friend here who is actually linked to A Star too. You know, uh, right? So Tinwi is down there, Professor Tan Tinwi. You know, we are feedback to us. You know, uh, we will take it back. You know, uh, and we will try to make sure that the future students get a better experience. Right? But science is very exciting. It's about discovering things, it's very how things work, you know, and it's, it's exciting. And, and this is from personal experience, right? My son, who is just uh, after JC, after NS, is now doing chemical engineering. He says, Dad, I don't want to be a chemical engineer after doing chemical engineering. I say, I don't, whatever you do, do it well, and you can decide what you do afterwards. The fact you're doing chemical engineering is good, because after doing engineering, you can do something else. If you do something else, like going to business administration, uh, going to political science, uh, you can't go back to the other way. <laughs> and engineering training is still a very good training. <laughs> All right. Yes? May I pick up on a point about um, bankers and engineers or scientists? <laughs> uh, if you look at all the uh, cities which are good at banking, they don't have good scientists. The, the what? If you look at cities which are good at banking cities. and finance, London, New York, Frankfurt, they don't have good scientists. And the, the ones which are good at engineering, they're all in Sweden or other parts of Germany or mm. some other parts of mm. America, uh, America or something. And in Singapore, if you want to have, you, you put banking as a growth sector, you're actually creating problems for yourself for scientists. Because the, the thing with the bankers is that, you know, you give them the temptation to sort of defy gravity and create miracles <laughs> and what they want to do. And so who wants to be a scientist when you can be a, you know, you can be a miracle worker? So. I beg to differ. London is a great city for science. You have Imperial College, you have University College, you have King's College, right? You have the Crick Institute now in, in the middle of London. You know, the Crick Institute is an agglomeration of all the biomedical science institutes which are brought into the Crick, started by Sir Paul Ness. He was the first director there. Great city of science, but it's also a banking center. New York. New York has Columbia. Columbia has got Nobel laureates. You know, Cornell Medical School is actually in New York City. Right? You have NYU. Right? Uh, of course, they are great city of arts too. You know, the Tisch is in New York, you know. But this is a mark of great city. They have got great science. They have great art. You know, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a microcosm of a lot of things. But they're not really exclusive. Today, I don't think, you know, we don't talk about STEM anymore. We don't science, technology, engineering, and maths. And now, we talk of STEAM, you know, science, technology, engineering, uh, arts, and maths, right? Uh, so this was a, came up from a discussion that I had recently with Sir Mark Walpert, the chief scientist of the UK, right? We cannot exclude art, right? You know, uh, art is science, science is art, right? You know. But this is just buzzword. But we, in reality, you look at the great cities. You know, London is a great city for science. Of course, you know, uh, you have Cambridge, of course, they're in close proximity. But London itself, you just look at the great universities there, University College, Imperial, Creek, King's. I mean, 
maybe QMC is not so great now, right? But you have London School of Economics, and economics is a science, right? You know? Some, some people might differ. <laughs> and uh, Frankfurt, I'm not so sure, right? You know, uh, I, I, but, you know, certainly New York, you know, is a great city of science. Tokyo, Tokyo is a great financial center, business center, but you have Tokyo Institute of Technology, they have Tokyo University, the Institute of Industrial Science in Tokyo University, they are, they are great institutes. But Singapore has got to aspire to be that, you know, we have to be a city of science, right, a science technology hub, at the same time we want to be, you know, to be, have, to have the artistic buzz at the same time, we, maybe we want to have the kick and eat it. Hi, good evening, Prof. Um... Thank you so much for the inspiring talk. Um, my question is more on the striking the balance and what your thoughts about it. So, I mean, it's very exciting to hear all these technologies, di disruptive technologies and all that. But how about, like, uh, in terms of the regulation and all that, I mean, there's always the good and the bad of all everything. So, w what's your thoughts of striking the balance? And um, is it like to follow MAS with the regulatory sandbox? Will it be applicable to all the sectors and all this? Thank you. No, there's no going to be one size that fits all. You know, let me tell you something. This may be preemptive, but you know, we are certainly going to put out a big initiative on AI. Right? Uh, there is uh, different organizations. I mean, in the UK, for example, um, there is the Turing Institute, which brought together five top British universities. And they may not be your usual five meeting of. UCL is there. Imperial is not, Edinburgh is there, Warwick is there, Bristol, and one more, right? And they're each known for different areas of data science. It's actually a data science consortium from which you will expand into AI, right? Japan is going to have a two billion program in AI. We want to be in AI because I've got the people in Singapore that are good at it. I think in certain areas we can excel. But even as we start, looking at the basic science, like what I call one-shot learning, natural learning, and all this, right? I need to put in the innovation platform as well as the industry side because in this area of technology, the link between the basic science and industry is very, very short. But even as I look at that, we need to look at the ethics, right? The, 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 the social science of the science they're working on, right? So, you know, uh, basically the regulatory environment, the ethics and all this will have to be addressed. So, maybe I'll tell you a short story which, in UK, there was this hospital that experimented with an AI system for triaging, you know. Somebody come in, you know, and, and you know, the, the system is to decide whether this person goes to intensive care, this person, you know, goes to, to, uh, to the, the, because, you know, he's not so sick that, you know, right. And this is, uh, basically to pick up uh, somebody with, uh, it's basically a, 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 a respiratory problem, right? So they did very well for everything, except that, you know, uh, there was one class of patients that it was disastrously wrong, right? And this is for those people who had a respiratory infection who has got asthma. Because we feed in all the data, they found out that those people who have got respiratory and asthma always have almost, almost in fact, invariably 100% you know, recovery very, very fast. Why? Because when you go to see a normal doctor, you have got asthma, you've got respiratory disease, you immediately send to intensive care, and then they get recovered very fast and get sent home. So this system that decides using all the data decided that, you know, if you've got asthma and you've got respiratory disease, you're okay because you can recover very quickly, right? Because the system cannot decide why it decided that way. At the moment, it doesn't know how, why it decided that way. Uh, and this was a story from BBC, which I was listening to. Right? But, you know, uh, there is still a lot way to go, but there are issues of ethics. Even as we look at precision medicine and genomic medicine, there's a question about ethics that has got to be addressed. So, you know, uh, uh, the sandbox that is built by, uh, by MBS for FinTech, I think, is the easy part of it. Some of these are much more complex, right? You know, uh, that deals with... Uh, health, uh, privacy, you know, uh, uh, are much more complex. So we have to address that in parallel. Now.